Hello and welcome to livealittlehigher.com. This next Monday night, we're gonna be celebrating the Rosh Hashanah of the trees. It's the 15th of Shvat, otherwise known as Tu Bishvat. And what does it mean, the Rosh Hashanah of the trees? Does this mean that all the trees in the world get together, sit around, make a seder, and dip their, their, their uh, apple in honey? No, that's not what it means. What it means uh, is that on Tu Bishvat, on this day, uh, the trees absor uh, stop absorbing the water from the ground, and they start nourishing themselves from their sap. And uh, in Jewish law, this means that the fruit which has blossomed prior to the 15th of Shvat could not be used as a tithe for the fruit which blossomed after that date. So the, the Torah compares men to a tree of the field. Uh, for as the days of a tree shall be the days of the people, uh, says Isaiah, and he will be like a tree planted near water, says Jeremiah. Why is that the comparison of a tree to a man? How are we compared to a, to a tree? And what lessons we can derive from our botanical friend? And it means here, uh, according to Rabbi Shraga Simons in his article, Man is a Tree, he describes, he says that a tree needs the four basic elements in order to survive. So as we know, the world was created with four basic elements, which are uh, earth, wind, uh, air, and, and water. And everything in the world, every, every material creation of the world has these uh, elements in it. And uh, the human being also requires the same basic elements in a spiritual way Way to be able to survive in the world. So let's uh, examine these, these elements one at a time and see how they are connected to the tree, how they are connected to the human being. So a tree, obviously, the first thing it needs is soil, it's earth. Uh, so it can be planted firmly in the ground and the soil is not only the source through which the tree uh, receives its nourishment but also it provides room for the roots to grow and this is also the place where you plant the seeds. And this is also true uh, regarding a person. The Talmud explains, this is in the Avot, in Perkei Avot 322, a person whose wisdom exceeds his good deeds is likened to a tree whose branches are numerous but whose roots are few. The wind comes and uproots it and turns it upside down. But a person whose good deeds exceed his wisdom is likened to a tree whose branches are few, but whose roots are numerous and strong. Even if all the winds of the world were to come and blow against it, they could not budge it from its place. So a person also can appear to be a very successful person in the outside, he can be very wealthy, he can have a great job, he can be handsome, he can be charming, he can be all these things. But if that person doesn't have roots, he doesn't have a connection to his heritage, at the end of the day, if God forbid he has a, 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 a something that makes him fall, he has no nowhere to 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 grab him. He has nothing. He has no roots. He has nothing that will sustain him through his hardship. So he says here that a person when he's alone he's vulnerable to trends and fads that may lead to despair and destruction but if a person irrespective of wealth and status is connected to his heritage to a community to his family eh, to a group of people he has a foundation, he has something that will sustain him through hardships and he won't blow away. The same way that a tree, if he has a, is a huge tree with a lot of branches but his roots are not strong roots, they're not deep roots, a hurricane will come and the tree will just blow away or break. But if a, true, if a tree, it can be a skinny tree with no, not many branches, not many leaves, but if the roots are strong and well grounded, the wind will come and the tree will be able to sustain himself. So humans require a strong home base. This is very important. We all need to have good values, good morals. We need to know who we are. We need to know where we come from. We need to know where we're going. We need to have a foundation. When people grow with no foundation, 
with no morals, with no uh, heritage, of, of, of no identity of who they are, then they are really, they can look, they can seem to be very strong in the outside, but in reality they're very weak in the, in the inside. And, um, and he says here that humans require a strong home base where values and morals are absorbed and which provides a supporting growth environment. In a world ripe with negativity, we need a filter, we need something, we need a safe place to return and to refresh ourselves. A community provides an impervious shield, the soul where we can ourselves make our, our own mistakes and still be accepted, loved, and nourished. So this is the, the the teaching of the soil, it's very important to have this in mind. And then it comes and talks about water. And as we know, rainwater is absorbed in the ground and through the elaborate system of the roots, then the, the tree carries uh, through the trunk, carries the nourishment to the branches and to the, and to the leaves. And without water, if it didn't rain, then the tree would become dry and die. So the Torah is also compared to water as Moses proclaims may my teachings drop like the rain both rain and Torah descend from the heavens and provide relief to the thirsty and parched Torah is compared to water because Torah is something that comes from a very high place it comes from a very lofty place and if you look at the component of water of its nature of water if water is not contained in a vessel it's gonna it's gonna spill and it's gonna trickle down. You need a vessel to be able to contain the water. The same way the Torah, it comes down from, from, from a lofty place, from heaven, and we are the vessel that are gonna be nourished by this Torah, by this water, and it trickles down to us, just as the rain trickles down into the soil and nourishes the tree. So the Torah flows down from God and has been absorbed by, by us in every generation, Torah gives zest and vitality to the human spirit and a life based on Torah will blossom with wisdom and good deeds. I remember the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and it's true, I, I guarantee it's true. It says if you have a headache, learn Torah. If you had a heart, heartache, learn Torah. Any malady you have, you are anxious, you're depressed, you're anything, go learn Torah. Because Torah is nourishment, Torah is food for the soul. It's something that will maintain us alive and fresh and it won't allow us to get dry. And, and I tell you, sometimes I teach classes of Torah to certain people and that day I have a horrible headache or I'm not feeling well or my nose is stuffy. The minute I sit down to teach Torah or to learn Torah, everything goes away, disappears. It's a miracle. So the pride of water, a person will become dehydrated in our physical sustenance we need to drink water because if not we become dehydrated and ultimately will become disoriented even the, to the point where they may not be able to recognize their own face their own father I'm sorry so too with Torah a person becomes disoriented to the extent that may not even recognize their father in heaven and the almighty God of Israel so Torah is something very important something that is really a must in our lives just as you wash your teeth and you bathe every day and you exercise to be healthy to be clean Torah is that counterpart in our spiritual life if we don't have Torah in our lives we're gonna be dry then comes the element of air and a tree needs air to survive. The air contains oxygen that a tree needs to for respiration and carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. In an imbalanced atmosphere, the tree would suffocate and die if he doesn't have this component. The Torah in Genesis 2.7 says, states that God breathed breath into into man, he breathed life into man. And the Hebrew word for breath is neshema, in the same as the word for soul, which is neshama. And our spiritual life work comes from metaphorically by way of air and respiration. So we use our senses of taste, we have taste, we have touch, we have sight, and uh, in everything that we perceive, even a hearing, involves the perception of a sound wave. So it says that the sense of smell, which is uh, in the air, is the most spiritual sense of all. It says that um, 
when Mashiach comes, we're going to recognize it by our smell. We're going to smell it. And the smelling is the most spiritual of all senses since the least physical matter is involved. It, the other senses, when you touch something, when you see something, there's physicality around you. But smell, you don't see what you're smelling. Sometimes, yes, you have a good uh, dish in the table and it smells delicious. But in general, if you're walking and you smell something delicious, you don't know where it's coming from. So in the holy temple, the incense offering was connected to the sense of smell and was elevated to the once a year uh, event in Yom Kippur which was in the offering of the Holy of Holies. And the Talmud in Sanhedrin in 93a also says that when Mashiach comes we will experience this smell and judge. And that is he will use this spiritual sensitivity to determine the truth about the complexity of, 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 of life. We'll be able to understand it. And then we come to the last element which is fire and fire uh, says here that a tree also needs fire and fire is sunlight is sun rays to survive if it doesn't have the the sun hitting it the absorption of energy from the light activates the process of photosynthesis so if a tree is growing in a very dark place it's not gonna grow and a chemical reaction is what is needed by when the sun hits the tree that is essential for the growth and the health of the tree so for human beings we also need fire. And what is fire compared to? Fire is compared to warmth, to passion, to zest of life, when we are like on fire, you know that feeling. And this is what gives us life. This is what wants us to be alive. When a person has no warmth and has no passion, has no uh, warmth in any way uh, through people, through life, he starts to to die. It, he can be alive, but in, inside he's cold, he's cold, he's freezing. So this is the warmth of the friendship and community. People absorb the energy of, of their peers, friends, family, neighbors, and associates, and channel that into identity and actions. That's why it's so important for parents to build a warm home, to have a home where there's love, where there's warmth, where there's music, where there's joy, because this is what helps helps a child grow in a very healthy way. When you live in a home where everybody's cold, there's no warmth, there's no home feeling, then people, the child was gonna grow uh, not well, not well in his head. Love cures everything and passion cures everything. We need to have love and passion in our lives and be warm. And all the essential observances and ceremonies in Judaism, if you look at them, are based on family and community, from the celebration, celebration of birth through the attainment of maturity, marriage, education, and even death. If we look at our, at our mesorah, at our traditions, we'll see that it's full of warmth. And we see in a Jewish home, there's always warmth. The mother always lighting Shabbat candles. She's cooking that fire that you put the food in the, in the, in the, in the fire. All, all that brings that warmth, that brings that well-being to the the family. So the power of community is illustrated in the following Talmudic story. And there's a famous story in the Talmud which says that an old man was planting a tree and a young person by, came by and asked the person, what are you planting? And he said, I'm planting a carob tree. So the, 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 the young guy said to the man, you're a silly fool, you, you're so full. This tree takes 70 years to grow and to give the carobs. And you're not gonna be here when this tree starts giving carobs. So why are you putting so much effort in planting this tree if you're not gonna be able to enjoy it? And the man answered the young man, that's okay, said the old man. Just as others planted for me, I'm, planted, I'm planting for my future generations. So from here we see that community, to think about others, to do for others, even if we don't take advantage of it, even if we're not uh, benefiting from it, someone else will, your children, your grandchildren. So we have to start planting. And, um, and, 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 and it's a time to grow. So I wanna leave you with some th food for thought uh, for you to meditate on, on this to wish back, ask yourself, 
Am I getting the spiritual food and shelter I need to survive? Or is my tree being blown down by the forces of information overload, Facebook, Instagram, emails, you name it, and rampant materialism? Am I part of a strong Jewish community providing a warm and nurturing environment? Or am I cast into the pale bleak anonymity of urban life and cyberspace? Am I just being sucked into the material world and I'm not have anything of humanity inside of me anymore? Am I looking to future generations knowing that I'm providing them with proper foundations for their lives? Are we looking to the future? What type of children do you want to have? What type of home do you want to have? What type of people you want to bring into this world? What type of world do you want to live in? I leave you with these thoughts and I wish you a Hag Sameah, a happy Tu Bishvat, and remember, live a little higher. Thank you.